Professor Klein back here with you for lecture number 12, the arm and the brachial plexus. Had to switch it up a little bit and include a little bit of comedy as we start this PowerPoint. And here we can see that famous funny bone, the humorous, but we'll actually answer the question today, is the funny bone when you hit it on a table and you feel that pain shoot down your arm, is that actually caused by a bone or something else? We will solve that mystery today. And to start, we can see a full view of the shoulder, the elbow, the wrist, the hand. So let's take a minute to just look all the way down the upper extremity or the arm to see all these bones. And we can see the humerus attaching to the radius and the ulna. Do note that the radius is always lateral. So it's always gonna be lateral or on the thumb side. The ulna, just the opposite. It's more medial and it's always gonna be in line with the pinky. And I give you both of those because you might see that in anatomical position like that picture, or it could be like this or like this and you still need to know which side the radius is on, which side the ulna is on. So just always track it out to either the pinky or the thumb. And we do know the pinky would be the fifth digit, fourth, third, and second, as well as the first. We will start using numbers instead of thumb, pinky, that sort of thing. Your thumb is called the pollux finger, the pollux. And your wrist is a collection of eight different carpal bones. And then there's metacarpals. And we're gonna get all the way to the hand, but a lot of the things that happen at the shoulder, at the elbow, have an effect on the hand. So you wanna be generally knowledgeable on the hand and the wrist before we look at the arm and brachial plexus. So I think you're good with the hand. Let's go to the elbow. And at the elbow, we're mainly talking about the articulation that's going on between the radius and the ulna. Radius and the ulna. Now when you're looking at how to differentiate these, hopefully the first thing that sticks out is this U shape in the ulna. So the ulna has a U, it's got a U shape. That's actually called the trochlear notch, but that is the U shape there. The radius, which would be this bone on the lateral portion, is essentially more rounded. So it's got this round radial head. It's got this kind of flatter round part at the other end as well. So if I were to show you an ulna bone, look for that ulnar notch right there. If I were to show you this bone, the radius, Look for that rounded radial head, but don't get either of these confused with this one, this long one. This is the fibula. We're gonna look at that in the lower body. So a couple of the bony landmarks on here that you'll wanna know is if you look on the back of the U, that's the olecranon process. So the olecranon process I will circle it right here, it's that bump. It's the bump on the back of your elbow. So you see this bump right here, kind of go ahead and feel for that. You can hit it on the table if you want to, but that bump is the olecranon process. Down here you can see something called the styloid process. The styloid process is a small bump at the wrist. So if you're on the pinky side and you feel down at your wrist, you should feel a small bump. Just like on the radial side, let me zoom in for you. Small bump right here. Then you go thumb side and you can still feel that bump. But now we're on the radius. So we're calling that the styloid process of the radius. Makes sense, right? Just change the bone keep the bony process the same. But a different process, and not even named a process, is the radial tuberosity. 
radial tuberosity is this bump up here more proximal on the radius. So if I'm looking at the radius, the radial head, notice how there's a bump sticking out to the side. That's the radial tuberosity. It has a lot of attachments for muscles. One last one before we move on, it's something called the radial notch is on the ulna. And anytime you have the name of another bone on a different bone, it's typically where that other bone attaches. So if that made sense, let's look at where that happens. So here we can see the radial notch slipped right in there under the number three on the ulna, which is where the radius is articulating. And it's a nice smooth area, and that's what we call the proximal radial ulnar articulation or joint. Cut it in half, you've got the radius, you've got the ulna. But the word proximal is super important because there's also a distal radial ulnar joint. But let's bring in that funny bone to talk about the other two joints of the elbow because actually the elbow's got three joints. So the radial proximal radial ulnar is one of them. But the other two are formed from the humerus and the two bones we just talked about. All right, first, let's look at the humoral ulnar joint. And if you look here, it comes in and it latches right on top of the trochlea. Now, if you look real close, it's a hinge joint and it's got this nice groove where the ulnar arch and the olecranon in the back locks in place. And if I tried to put this on the capitulum, it, it wouldn't stay. There's really only one part for that ulnar notch to go. So that's the humoral ulnar joint. Sitting right next to it is the humoral radial joint. Now this one is a combination of the head of the radius, head of the radius and the capitulum. So make sure you know the two things that form that joint. And if we take away that, you can see it more clearly. You can also see it up here. Notice trochlea, capitulum. This one's different because it doesn't really lock in, but it, the head of the radius is going to sit right underneath that capitulum and allow for a lot of rotations to occur. So that joint's really important for pronation, supination, or turning your forearm. Here we can see that supination and pronation movements and actions that are unique to the elbow and the wrist Oftentimes we'll say this is forearm movement going on here, but notice how the radius rolls, radius rolls over top of the ulna. The ulna kind of stays locked in place, just like we saw it was locked in place at the elbow, but the radius is the one that's going to be doing the rotation or the supination and pronation of the forearm. Quick anatomy question for you. Why can you not extend your elbow further typically than horizontal or having a flat elbow? Why can't you bend it further down? Tell me anatomically in five seconds. The answer is because anatomically, that olecranon process goes into the humerus and the olecranon fossa, and it could not go any further because it's blocked by that olecranon process. So it's got a physical barrier preventing it from bent or straightening anymore. If you were to be able to straighten it any more than about flat, parallel to the ground, then that would be an issue. Next slide here I absolutely love because it begins to talk about the fascia from the chest and the pectoral region all the way down to the hand. And if you're not familiar with fascia, it's all throughout the body and it actually 
can pull on certain areas and have effects way down your extremities. So for example, we've got the pectoral fascia, the axillary fascia, clavipectoral fascia, and then deltoid fascia. If these are tight or pulling, you might get a pull more down towards your elbow or wrist. Because here we can see the brachial fascia, brachial fascia in the brachium or the biceps area of the arm and the antibrachial, which would be forearm. So make sure you know your body regions for this here. This picture though, what we're looking at is the skin on the outside, skin on the outside, fat. And then as we get into the muscle, we've got the different fascial layers, not only surrounding these compartments, but dividing it into an anterior and posterior sections. And this is the shaft of the humerus. So we got the bone right here, but there's a pretty equal anterior and posterior region. It's well balanced as you go down the arm. And speaking of well balanced things, the blood vessels are very well balanced as they go down the arm or rather the brachium and the antibrachium to the hand. They get a lot of blood supply as you go down. And this is where we start to talk about what the branches coming off the heart would be. So coming off the heart, we know we've got the brachiocephalic going to the right, which would then go into the right subclavian. But right about the axillary region, it changes and it becomes the right axillary artery. And then once you're through the axillary region, it becomes the right brachial artery. And I'm giving you essentially division lines between those. So same blood vessel, but it's named differently based upon where it's at in the body. Now focus on the ones that are listed in the PowerPoint. Uh, things like the subscapular artery, don't need to know, and other ones, superior thoracic artery, other ones like that that aren't mentioned, listed out, you do not need to know. So with the arm being well supplied with blood, it's got a lot of those big blood vessels going through it, which means if you cut into those blood vessels, you can lose a lot of blood. So luckily, the axillary is deep within the armpit. So deep within that axillary region, so you're well protected when you're adducted, but if your arm was abducted and there was an injury to that area, that's when you have exposed blood vessels, lots of blood loss, and possibly some emboli in those areas. Now I also wanna throw out a word called anastomosis. Anastomosis is basically small communications between blood vessels. So we show the big blood vessels, right? But just do note that there's communication between the different arteries, between the arteries and the veins. Again, every blood vessel lined up end to end to end would circle the earth two, if not three times. So the anastomosis is, is one of the reasons that that is a true fact. And as we pass the axillary region, we get down to the brachium or the brachial artery. So we wanna look at this brachial artery. This one is so important clinically, taking a blood pressure, taking a pulse is coming from the brachial artery. So I'm gonna, again, kind of separate it out here for brachial. I probably highlighted this area because this is the medial bicipital groove where you would take that pulse. So take a second, follow along with me, stretch your arm on out, feel for the medial epicondyle of your humerus. And when you found that, take your fingers and go about an inch laterally and an inch uh, proximally, and you'll feel your biceps and then you'll feel underneath your biceps. I want you to push underneath your biceps and you should feel a pulse. If you don't know what a pulse feels like, practice, try it out, because you're gonna to need to know in human physiology and beyond.
So when you're taking a blood pressure, you have to find that brachial pulse coming from the brachial artery and take the stethoscope and put it right on that pulse so that you can hear what's going on in that artery. All right, so make sure you know that brachial artery so that you can take blood pressures properly. We also want to know a cross section, so this will be a transverse plane view down here. We can see that humerus, we've got some muscle posteriorly, some muscle anteriorly, and then more medially, again, which is why you take that pulse on the medial side, is the artery and the vein and some nerves are more medial rather than lateral. Now here's the unfortunate news about the brachial artery is that it's really the only main path to get down to the elbow, the wrist, and the hand. So if you have ischemia in this artery, then within hours, you're talking about scar tissue and damage to some of those muscles down the line. So anything you include up here, it's gonna affect down the line. All right, and remember arteries are traveling away from the heart. So we're gonna do some blood mapping where you have to track blood through the body. So we'll always talk about arteries as they travel away from the heart. But when we talk about veins, we're gonna talk about veins traveling back towards the heart. So I'm gonna start down in the hand and talk about things like the deep pulmonary venous arch as well as the radial vein the ulnar vein traveling up this direction and then forming the brachial vein so these two will converge into one and form the brachial vein and then it's the same the way back you got the axillary vein the subclavian vein and then we're getting back to the heart but that's just one of the main sets of veins traveling back. So arteries, there's only one way to get down. Veins, there's two ways to get back. So one, we just said brachial vein, that's deep, deep, deeper. That's essentially as deep as you can go for the venous system. But there's also the superficial veins, which are more superficial, on the skin. So that's these over here. These are higher up and basically closer to the skin. So you might even be able to see, if you look at your own skin, some of these veins popping out. And the main ones that we have are the cephalic vein and the basilic vein. The cephalic vein is like the super highway. It's going to travel all the way up to the subclavian vein it's going from the wrist up to the shoulder that's a long way to travel for one vein so that's like the super highway kind of like the super highway but not as long as the basilic this one's more medial it's actually going to go into the axillary vein right here so it makes it one step before what the cephalic vein made as well now, if you're giving blood, which I highly suggest giving blood if you have, and I gave some a couple weeks ago, they will go and they will look for your median cubital vein. This is the vein that connects the cephalic and the basilic, and it runs right across that cubital fossa or the inside of your elbow, so it's easy to get to, to stick a needle in and pull out that blood. Here's another look at the cephalic and basilic veins. Again, superficial veins. The key way to note deep versus superficial are deep veins will have a corresponding artery. Deep veins will have a corresponding artery, like the radial vein has 
the radial artery or the brachial vein has the brachial artery. But cephalic and basilic, they're superficial. They don't have any arteries with them. They're just veins. And here we do want to note that the median cubital vein is a continuation of the cephalic vein. It's coming up and jumping over and basically getting off the superhighway, getting on a little smaller highway and traveling up there. Let's pause, jump back for a second. What I want you to do is I want you to track blood from the brachiocephalic trunk right here. I want you to list all the arteries that you would have to travel on to get from the brachiocephalic trunk all the way to the radial artery on the right side. And then after the radial artery, I want you to go to the radial vein. And then I want you to go back up to the subclavian vein. So take a minute, pause the video, write out all the steps, and then I'll give you the answer in a minute. So hopefully you got a minute to write that out. Here is the correct answer. This is essentially what it should look like. We'll go through each one of them here for you. But on an exam, you will have to write it out just like this. Every single location that you will want to go to. Remember things like you got to tell me it's the right side of the body because there's also a left. So remember to put right at least once after that. I kind of can tell you're on the right side of the body, but let me know which side you're on. Plus, notice right here, when you get to the radial artery, oops, where is it at? Radial artery, to get to the radial vein, you gotta go arterioles, capillaries, venules, and then the vein. So let's look at that up close. All right, so I'm reading off my sheet here, and essentially if we start in the brachiocephalic, trunk and again trunk is an artery so that would be right here that would be the first thing you say and then the second thing would be the right subclavian right subclavian artery right axillary blood's coming down next we get to the brachial artery and not shown but it splits here and it goes to the radial as well as the ulnar arteries. And you can use the word, the letter A to tell me it's an artery. So we would come down and we would go this way to the radial artery. Okay. So I've drawn that on the vein so that you can see the path that we just took down. The black line will be the path. But you know what? I've got the option to make it red. So let me make it red for you. This would be the artery or blood traveling down to the radial artery. Now let's say it's supplying a muscle in the forearm. It would stop at this area. And that's where it would cross over from artery, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and then it would hop on the corresponding vein in that area, which is the radial vein. You can't go from, let's say the radial artery to the subclavian vein. You'd be jumping a large distance without anything in between. This just doesn't work. So it's gotta be an artery to a vein that's in the same location. So a quick Google search got me to here. If you're like, all right, let me show me what that looks like, the artery to the vein. So let's say this would be the radial, oops, 
radial artery right here. And then over here, we've got the radial vein. And let's say in the middle, we've got the muscle, right? So the blood would literally be coming right up against, to exchange things, you gotta be right up against the muscle. So the artery comes in, then it becomes the arterial, smaller artery, and then the capillaries, the smallest blood vessel you can go, one cell thick right here, one cell thick, and that's where it's pressed against the muscle, and the muscle would absorb the oxygen and take up any nutrients as well as give off any CO2. So we've got this exchange going on, but then it becomes blue because we've given up oxygen. Oxygen makes it red, it becomes a venule, and then the vein, and then we're back to this picture right here. And we've essentially went from this artery over to the vein. Again, they'd be right on top of one another in order for that exchange to happen. But then we're traveling up. You gotta follow the rules of blood mapping. So you gotta be on a vein if you're going back to the heart. You can't go backwards up an artery. So now I'm on the vein. Now I would travel up the radial vein to the brachial vein, to the axillary vein, and then subclavian after that. And that's my finishing destination. All right, I took some extra time on that because blood mapping is a very important skill to know. As we learn all the blood vessels, we learn the heart and the brain. Now we're just connecting it. And these will be some extended response questions on your exam. All right, we also have some lymphatic drainage going on here. And just know anything with the lymph system. Again, it's just like the venous system, but it's going up and it's draining into more and more lymph nodes. A highly concentrated area of lymph nodes is in the axillary region underneath the armpits. So underneath the armpits, as well as the cervical region, you've got a lot of axillary or a lot of lymphatic nodes, lymph nodes. So that process would look something like this, where you're going from different lower level lymph nodes all the way up and up and up as you get to the right or left areas or venous angles, which would drain back into the blood systems. And we can see that occurring right here on this picture. Take a second to note a few different clinical issues that can happen with the lymph vessels, inflammation of the lymph vessels, blockage of the vessels can occur in certain things and cause different issues. All right, I think we're ready for some muscle. We're ready to look at the brachium and a little bit of the anti-brachium and the surface anatomy is what we're getting kicked off with. So maybe one of the most famous surface anatomy muscles is the biceps brachii. It's this muscle right here, but we'll look at some more of it triceps brachii on the back, you've got to have the full name. So if you don't have the brachii at the end, if it's a fill in the blank question, doesn't count. And let's start with that biceps and the brachialis as our two main elbow flexors. So we grouped it into the elbow flexors. And here we can see the bicep brachii. It's by two seps, different heads of the bicep brachii. Uh, one of the heads we've already seen, the long head, going all the way up to the glenoid cavity, or this capsule area. But the other head, the short head, and you can see short head, long head right here. The short head is originating up at the coracoid process. So now we have the two different insertion points for the bicep brachii, as well as the origin down here. Now, when I first learned this, I didn't even know there was a muscle called the brachialis underneath your biceps. I just thought it was all biceps. But no, 
there's another one. And that brachialis is going to stop, though, in the middle of the humerus and travel down to the ulna. So this one has a little bit different attachment places. It's smaller, but it does quite a bit of elbow flexion. One last one on here called the coracobrachialis. This one's coming from the coracoid process, going down to the humerus. It's smaller. It doesn't cross the elbow joint, which a muscle has to cross a joint to have an action on that joint. So the coracobrachialis, it crosses over the glenohumeral joint. So it has the action of shoulder flexion shoulder flexion, very weak, very weak muscle. Hate to criticize this muscle and insult it to its face, but the coracobrachialis is small and it's a very weak muscle of shoulder flexion. Here we can see some cadaver pictures of things like the biceps brachii, not as large as you might think. And even in larger individuals, there's a lot of skin and fat on top of the biceps most often which gives it a larger look. But here we can see the bicep brachii uh, around, let me do it in right here, around that brachium area, the deltoid covering the muscle as it goes deep. But let's say we remove the deltoid and down here, that's what we can see with the brachialis muscle. So we've also removed the biceps down here and you can see that muscle specifically. So I gave you the answer to this one. This is the brachialis muscle. So now we start to get multiple lists going here. We got lists for the flexors, we got lists for the extensors. Well, save the brachioradialis, brachioradialis as a elbow flexor, but we'll talk about that one shortly. Let's look at our extensors. Actually, don't get ahead of yourself, Professor Klein. We got to talk more about the biceps brachii. So here's the biceps brachii in that table that I said is the gold standard when you're talking about insertions and origins. So notice the short head has its origin. The long head has its other origin. A very detailed question that you might see is the difference between, let's say, these different heads. Or I'll show you a picture and I'll say, the green head of this muscle or the green muscle has what origin and it is different than the red muscle right so the green one would be the short head going to the choroid process which we can see here the long head is going to the supraglenoid tubercle up top around the glenohumeral joint you also want to Note the nerve, we're going to talk about all these nerves coming from the shoulder through what's called the brachial plexus. So just hang on to the nerves for now. Here are the tables for the coracobrachialis and the brachialis. I'll let you read through them. We've covered them a little bit. But again, notice the common nerve. Anything that flexes the elbow plus the coracobrachialis we're talking about musculocutaneous nerve. Write that one out, say it with me, musculocutaneous nerve. So here's a clinical question. Let's say you're trying to strengthen the brachialis versus the biceps brachii, knowing that the action of each muscle will focus on that muscle. So let's watch to see how you can focus on the brachialis versus the biceps brachii. All right, here's Arnold Schwarzenegger giving us a lesson on that question. Okay, the dumbbells, dumbbells are very good for arm development, for the, the, the biceps, okay? You start them off your thigh area, then you pick them up slowly. Notice shoulder. the two actions that he's doing. It's always very slow. At the elbow. Concentrate on the muscle you're training. It's a very simple exercise that everybody can do that. Why don't you try this? So watch what happens when this guy tries it. What is looking for proportion, symmetry, the size of the muscles, you know, how you pose and present the muscles to the judges. Okay, why, why don't you do it the way I did? Arnold corrects him. You start right on the thighs, then you 
turn it up because the biases have two jobs to do. One is to lift up the forearm, the other one is to turn the wrist. Two actions. Yeah. Well, we got some. You already pumped up. I can't believe that. So notice how he said it. two different things: curl and twist. You tell me what anatomical actions was he referring to? If you said elbow flexion and supination of the forearm, you'd be correct. So Arnold knew that to work the biceps brachii more, you flex and supinate at the top. If you try that, start in a pronated position and let me just show you a bigger picture here. Pronated, 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 flexing, and then supinate at the top. You're going to work more the bicep brachii versus the brachialis. Because the brachialis just does elbow flexion. That's why people pay personal trainers and physical therapists money to know the difference between those two muscles and the small minute details. So that's one example. If you want some more information on that, we do have an Athlean X video down here to check out. On this picture though, notice the difference between the brachialis and then the biceps brachii up here. I'll put by and BR for that. Those are two different muscles. The brachialis can prop up the biceps brachii since it's right underneath it. All right, now we're onto those elbow extensors. You got to even it out, right? So these are on the posterior side. And the main one is the triceps brachii. Try three heads that we're going to look at. And then a smaller one called the Antonius. Much, much smaller. So we'll focus in on the biceps or triceps brachii first. Here's the triceps, brachii, and all three heads. Notice that you've got a lateral, medial, and then long head. Is there a short head of the triceps? Nope. There is a short head and a long head of the biceps, but the triceps only has a long lateral and medial head, as you can see them here. Notice that the medial head is deep so it's green and you can't really even see it from this posterior view but from an anterior view you can see it kind of curving around the humerus they've removed the other heads down here so that you could see that medial head it really just stops here and here so look for differences in the origins from long lateral to medial they all do elbow extension but the long head specifically does some glenohumeral extension because this one, this one originates on the scapula. The other two originate on the humerus. So it crosses a second joint, which means that long head has two actions. The other ones just have one with all of them inserting on the electron. Also notice radial for these, anything posterior is gonna be the radial vent or the radial nerve. So I love the posterior aspect of the brachium and the antibrachium because it's all the radial nerve. Here, we can see a cadaver picture of the triceps brachii, but the question I want you to answer in the next 15 seconds is, the names of the different heads. So you've got one going up here. You've got one coming down here. One is deep that you can't see. So there's only two different heads. Take five seconds, try to name it. All right, here's the answer for you. This one over here is the long head because you know the long head attaches, originates on the scapula but the lateral head stops at the humerus. So the two that you can see most superficially are L and L. Medial would be deep. And I like to say that because 
oftentimes the lateral head and the long head will get confused with the medial. But take away the medial because you can't see it. And the lateral has to be more lateral than all the other ones. So then that leaves the long head as this final head right here. All right, with an action like elbow extension, how are we doing this action? Well, multiples of ways. One way is a classic tricep kickback where you start flexed. So this would be at the starting position right here. And then you finish in elbow extension. Now it's gotta be against gravity. So you just couldn't let your elbow drop. You would have to raise it up back behind you. So try this out a couple reps. Grab a weight, take the weight, bend your arm back into glenohumeral extension, flex the elbow, and then extend it. Back down, extend it. Let's get a couple reps going here. I know everybody's doing it at home, so grab a can of soup or anything that's laying around, get a couple reps going because you know what? Just seven, eight reps in, I can feel the posterior brachium muscle, that triceps brachii burning because I am working that muscle with that weight. Now remember the opposite of the action is typically the stretch. So the opposite of the, or the opposite of the action would be elbow flexion. So that's why we do this stretch. Try this one out. Flex this on up. You probably feel that tricep muscle stretch out when you do this. And that's because it's the opposite of the action. All right. That was the end of the brachial muscles. Let's bring the nerves into it. I've got the pipe cleaner brachial plexus here, but let's look at it on the PowerPoint slideshow. The brachial plexus is formed da -da -da -da, by C5 to T1. So those levels of the spinal cord converge the spinal nerves of those levels, as you can see them coming out here, one, two, three, four, five different levels total coming out and intertwining and mixing and jumping and splitting and doing a bunch of stuff in here, right? And then eventually you get to what are called cords, lateral, posterior, and medial cords, which then split and converge again to get to what we call peripheral muscles peripheral muscles, right? Or peripheral nerves. Careful what you're saying, Professor Klein. Peripheral nerves that would innervate a muscle. That's different from a spinal nerve, which is just branching off the spinal cord. Also note that there is a cervical plexus and a sacral plexus and a lumbar plexus, but we're going to focus on the brachial plexus because clinically, it's one of the most important areas of the body. And it supplies not only the muscles, but the cutaneous areas as well. So remember those dermatomes that we talked about way back in one of the earlier PowerPoints? This is a representation of the dermatome. So let's say that spinal nerve, let's go with, oops, let's bounce it back here. Let's go spinal nerve. C6, it's coming off, it's coming down, eventually coming out, and when it comes out, it will innervate this area of the skin. And this area is represented just by this outline, right? A lot of overlap, a lot of variation from person to person, but if you can't feel your thumb, let's say you can't feel the thumb, then you could track that back up to C6. So that's why the clinical testing is so important, knowing the function, because if you lose the function, you can track it back to what produces that function. But in addition to dermatomes, we've got 
the brachial plexus innervating actual muscles. So let's take a closer look at the brachial plexus. And the one I've got here, it's pretty similar to actual size. So if I, if I put this up to my shoulder, oops, to my shoulder like this, and let it go down my arm, that would essentially be what we're looking at here. Here are the spinal nerves coming off the spinal, or yeah, coming off the spinal cord. Uh, then we get into some things called trunks. Superior, middle, inferior trunk. Then it crisscrosses between the superior and middle trunk. Inferior goes into the middle trunk. And basically they get jumbled up and they come back out as cords. We said lateral posterior, medial, and those are actually where they're at on the body. So posterior would be in the back, lateral, and then medial in here. Then more crisscrossing, like we said, and they form five peripheral nerves. Here are the five peripheral nerves that I've labeled. I'll let you read them. You should recognize muscular cutaneous from, take a second, what muscles are innervated by the musculocutaneous nerve. If you said biceps brachii, brachialis, coracobrachialis, all your elbow flexors, you would be correct. Now you also hopefully recognize radial. Radial innervates what? muscles five seconds quick five seconds here radial is innervating everything posterior triceps brachii and coneus all the way down the posterior aspect of the arm which makes sense that the radial nerve is branching off the posterior cord because it is innervating the posterior muscles. So you're going to see a lot of proximity themes going on here as well. And these nerves don't stop here. They travel all the way down, or at least a few of them travel all the way down to the hand. So visualize this stretching all the way down the hand, uh, except for the muscular cutaneous that would stop at the biceps, except for the axillary, which we're going to look at, stops at the shoulder. Now also remember that serratus anterior that's innervated by the long thoracic nerve. If I close my box here, now you can see that's coming from C5, C6, C7, forming number four, the long thoracic nerve that would be coming down to the serratus anterior. Number six, medial pectoral nerve, also know where that's going as well. So draw this out, throw some lines on it like this to divide the nerves, the trunks, the divisions, the cords, the peripheral nerves. Really take some time on this because there will be a lot of questions about this on the exam. Now, a couple things to note with the brachial plexus, C5 to T1, again, those anterior rami of the spinal nerves, but it goes through the anterior and middle scaling. And you go, scale what? Scalene, the muscles of the neck. Go back to the neck PowerPoint. If you forgot what the scalenes are, it's all right. Refresh yourself. But know that the brachial plexus is going through the anterior and middle scaling. So it's, it's splitting these muscles as it travels inferior to the clavicle, inferior to the clavicle, and the axillary artery, which is an artery you're gonna see, is pretty much in the middle of those peripheral nerves. A nice summary slide here for you with the trunks and what makes up those areas, the divisions, the cords. I focus on trunks and cords, but definitely still know those divisions. And also note down here, take a look down here, an M, you might all often hear about the brachial plexus M, that's formed 
by the muscular cutaneous, the median, and the ulnar nerve. Now, if you're looking at it upside down from anatomical position, it's a W, but most often it looks like an M. Here's a video if you want to check out the pipe cleaner model. Not going to test on the pipe cleaner, but it's a, it's a cool way, I think, to represent the brachial plexus. But we're looking at the posterior cord first and the things that branch off the posterior cord. We had mentioned one of them, and one of them is the radial nerve itself hitting the extensors, hitting the posterior compartment. That's the radial nerve coming off the posterior cord. Now, to track the radial nerve back all the way to the spinal nerves, which is what I want you to do, C5 through T1, those five spinal nerves make the radial nerve. So if you cannot extend your elbow or a patient cannot extend their elbow and you know it's nerve damage, then C5 to T1 has been damaged. Next up, you've got your axillary nerve, which is only C5 to C6, which innervates two main muscles. I want you to know both of these, the deltoid and the teres minor. Remember deltoid coming off the top. Here's the teres minor. So those are the two muscles by the axillary nerve. So deeper level thinking for you. If you can not extend your elbow, but you can abduct your shoulder and external rotate your shoulder, which is the deltoid and the teres minor. That means, well, maybe C5 and C6 weren't as damaged as we thought because we can still do these things, but we might not be able to do the things that C7, C8, and T1 have given us for the radial nerve. Another look at some of these here, as we start to go through them, always reference back to the picture and say, okay, can I see the axillary nerve? Can I see the radial nerve? And in this view, this is an anterior view, you can't really see those that well. You can see the axillary artery and vein, but the nerves coming off the back. You can see that long thoracic nerve now as it travels down to the serratus anterior, but the other ones are posterior, so you can't see those as well. And the final three that we'll look at here, I'm gonna group them together because they don't innervate anything in the brachium. They are in the antebrachium and the hand. Other than the muscular cutaneous, just would be the ulnar and the median right here. So muscutaneous does stop in the brachium, but the other two go down to the wrist and the forearm and the hand itself. But the key thing we wanna note right now is answering that question of what exactly is the funny bone. It's actually not the humerus. The humerus does play a role though. So what you'll notice is as the ulnar nerve travels down, and we are medial here, travels down, travels down, it goes posterior to the medial epicondyle of your elbow. So that's the big bump, right? Feel directly posterior to that. If you move it around enough, be careful, but if you move it around enough, you'll feel a shock wave go down to your hand because your funny bone is actually you hitting your ulnar nerve against the humerus, but the ulnar nerve is what causes that pain. Nerves cause the pain when they are aggravated. So that's, that's the end of that mystery. Uh, the funny bone is technically the ulnar nerve. One last look at the muscular cutaneous nerve as it, we know it is C5 and C7 and does these flexors of the arm. Injury to this one's actually pretty rare because it's protected, but the other ones can get damaged quite a bit. And here's a summary slide of all those peripheral nerves. 
as we can see, we added in the ulnar, which is this C8 and T1, as well as the median, which is C5 and T1. Don't get median mixed up with medial. There's a medial cord, but it's the median nerve. And I also have listed out the general areas of where these would innervate. We'll get to those muscles specifically later, but the other ones that we have gotten to, I've listed out as actual muscles. So when I ask you, this peripheral nerve has these spinal nerves that compose it, there is a brachial plexus mnemonic. I do want to note, this is different from dermatomes. So don't look at this as dermatomes. This is a mnemonic for remembering what spinal nerves compose which peripheral nerves and what muscles those innervate. So just for the sake of this mnemonic, if you label your fingers C5 through T1 like they have down there, you don't actually have to write it on your body. Just kind of remember that. Then if you say the mnemonic, kind of silly, but here it is. If you say three musketeers assassinated five mice, five rats, two unicorns, and you hold up the corresponding fingers, it will tell you what spinal nerves innervate or make up that peripheral nerve. For example, the musculocutaneous three musketeers, C5, C6, and C7. Again, your fingers are just a way to remember the spinal nerves, but those are the three that make up the musculocutaneous nerve. And when you say musketeer, it sounds like musculocutaneous. Axillary, assassinated, starts with an A, C5, C6 only. Five mice, mice median, all five. Five rats, you're starting to get the hang of it, is radial, all five, and then two unicorns is just C8 and T1. I give this to you because students typically struggle with what spinal nerves are made up or make up which peripheral nerves. So use this to your advantage. Or if you have a better one, let me know. I also will relate it to the muscles that are innervated. So for example, three musketeers, musketeers, typically somebody who has big bicep muscles in my head, right? That's just kind of what I picture. I picture their bicep muscles as well as brachialis and the coracobrachialis. Assassinated, I picture essentially a needle. So a needle going into the deltoid and the teres minor. Deltoid and teres minor. For that mice median, if you have a mouse, which I'm using a mouse right now, a computer mouse, what do you do? You put your hand over top of it and you flex. So you flex your forearm and you use your thumb as well. And thumb and finger, of course. Rats, if you see a rat, or if I see a rat, I'm gonna backhand the rat, try to get the rat away. And when I do that, I extend my wrist, I extend my elbow, and I extend my shoulder. So I remember rats, radial extension for everything posterior. And then unicorn, U, it goes down the ulnar side of the forearm to the pinky, pinky side. That's the muscles that the ulnar innervates. So like I said, if this helps you, use it. If not, find something that will help you remember these. Changing gears just a little bit to clinical injuries that we might see with these muscles and nerves. First is biceps tendonitis, overworking the biceps. You get tendonitis up in that shoulder. You can also rupture the long head of the biceps more commonly where the tendon rips off of the bone. So here what you're seeing is essentially the muscle is bulged 
or bulged up. It should be up here, but that attachment has been ripped off and it bunches up down here. All right, let's look at what that would look like in real time. All right, I find this compilation video of these. So if you don't like bicep tendon tears, look away, skip ahead in the video. But I wanna know this a very interesting thing about all these tears. We're gonna watch about six of them. So here we go. Some nice music. This is on the left arm. And these are all deadlifts. Watch the left arm. The insertion of the biceps completely rips off of the bone. And you can see it bulge up. Watch this one specifically. Ouch. So what did you notice? You notice an excessive, excessive amount of weight with a deadlift being put on the arms. But what else did you notice? We'll talk in our small professional teams about something I noticed in all of those tears that you just watched. And we'll talk maybe about why it is the way it is. So let's keep going clinical here. And we'll talk about the bicipital mitatic reflex. And this reflex is just like any other reflex in the body where you take the reflex hammer and you would hit it against the biceps. And in this case, the biceps would do the action of the biceps and flex a little bit. So if there's no flexion that occurs, then C5, C6 might be damaged. Again, track it up and you could throw C7 in there as well. Three musketeers, the nerve that innervates that muscle. Now take away the reflex hammer and you can still test these muscles and some things like a withdrawal reflex where the signal that you just touch something hot goes in. And when you touch things, you typically have, or typically have your arm extended. So when you do that, the reflex tells your biceps to contract and your triceps to relax, causing you to bend your elbow and rapidly pull your hand away. If you didn't do that and your arm didn't bend, you couldn't pull away, right? So that reflex is a protective mechanism for preventing injury in your body. Here's a look at what the triceps tendon reflex test would be for the triceps tendon right in here. But beyond testing, let's get to some actual brachial plexus injury. And the first thing could just be paralysis. So paralysis is loss of muscular movement, or it could be anesthesia, loss of that cutaneous sensory sensation. You might have experienced anesthesia if you've got a backpack and that backpack puts a lot of pressure on your shoulders and then you take that backpack off and it just feels kind of numb, that could be anesthesia because that backpack was putting a ton of pressure, the straps of it, right on the brachial plexus. Furthermore, if you have something like a superior trunk damage of the brachial plexus caused by, let's say, an injury or something called herb de shin palsy, which is seen here, uh, that can be essentially done during birth, where the doctor stretches out the brachial plexus and causes damage to that superior trunk. Either way that it happens, it can result in what's called a waiter's tip. So back in the day, waiters, I guess, would hold their arm like that uh, so that you would tip them. But that is the name for this arm and hand and wrist position that is caused by injury to the superior trunk. So if you track it here, it says adducted shoulder, medial rotation or internal rotation. 
and then extended elbow. Basically, the opposite of those. So to abduct your shoulder, to externally rotate it, abduction is deltoid, external rotation, teres minor. So what nerve would that be? If it's abduction and external rotation, deltoid, teres minor, that's the axillary nerve. And then to the extend the elbow, if you need to flex the elbow, that's the muscular cutaneous nerve to the biceps brachii and brachialis. So what it's saying is the arm is in the opposite positions of the damaged muscles because this individual, let's say, cannot abduct the shoulder, externally rotate and uh, flex the elbow, then their arm goes into the opposite actions right here. One of my roommates a couple years ago actually had this condition and he could still do everything in the house as far as we all had house chores and stuff. And he was a computer scientist, uh, master's student. So uh, individuals will be taught or learn different ways to overcome some of these injuries, but it might take a physical therapist, an occupational therapist for sure, if it's dealing with workplace-like activities, especially with the hands and the wrist. Another issue that can occur is called the clump key paralysis here. Also something that can be damaged during child birth. So a lot of issues that happen during childbirth can affect you or that patient throughout their life or overstretching in let's say a position like this if you're caught on a tree or hanging on to something as well. But mainly we're injuring the inferior trunk C8 to T1 on this and muscles of the hand are definitely affected because the inferior trunk we're talking mainly that ulnar nerve. So the ulnar nerve is the pinky and the fingers down here. The claw hand is referring to when you try to make a claw, which would be like this, the fingers that are innervated by the ulnar nerve do not flex. And because they don't flex, they stay up like this and you know that the ulnar nerve has been affected. Let's say there's a fracture of the humerus. You might get limited ability to abduct the arm from the deltoid because the axillary nerve is traveling very close to where damage might be in a fractured humerus. Here you can see that axillary nerve branching and we're going posterior here, coming around, going to what would be the deltoid. If you fracture this area right here, well, you're mainly gonna hit that axillary nerve and not be able to abduct the shoulder. And final clinical thing here for you is a radial nerve injury, which we know the radial nerve extends everything because it's posterior. So if you cannot extend your wrist, you will have a wrist drop, which means it's in the flex position. You cannot extend it like this. So a wrist drop is going to be coming from the radial nerve injury. And lastly, last slide, just talking about the cubital fossa of how everything is running through that elbow region. And there's a very shallow triangular depression for a lot of things to run through there. All right, that's the end of this PowerPoint as we worked our way from the shoulder down to the elbow and a little bit beyond. We're gonna continue working to the forearm and the hand in the next couple of PowerPoints. So make sure you check those out and have a nice day.